Hi everyone, how are you tonight? Can I get some responses in the chat just to make sure you can hear me? Hi, Sierra. Right, we're quiet, that's okay, that's okay. Um, so we're here tonight to learn about derivatives and how those look on graphs and how we relate those to our regular functions, our second derivatives, um, and what, what we should do when we see a graph and we see a function, how do we relate those? Um, so if you give me a second, I'm gonna put you guys on my PowerPoint and we'll go through that together. All right, almost there. Okay, can you see my PowerPoint screen? Oh, for some reason my name got copied using Megan Dwyer. That should say using graphs. Um, I'm not sure why it got copied to that, but we'll fix that after before we post this for good. Um, but welcome. We're here to interpret derivatives and applications using graphs. Um, so let's move on to the next slide so we can see what we have to do today. Okay, well, first we want to make sure um, if you're with Fiveable for the first time, make sure you follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Um, this is a great resource for any AP class. Um, to make sure you're thinking Fiveable. Okay, so our agenda for today, interpreting derivatives and using graphs. So First, we want to talk about the meaning of a derivative. This is going to be review from Mr. Kossoff's um, presentation on Tuesday. We're going to go over what he did. We're going to use some of his slides. He did a great job on those, um, and that's going to get us going. We're going to talk about notations and units of measurement, interpreting in a sentence, and interpreting in a graph. The graph is the only new part of that right now. Um, and then we're going to estimate derivatives using a graph with average rate of change. We're going to define new functions using those derivatives um, and by finding derivatives. And we're going to use chain product and quotient rule according to graphs. A lot of times this can look really abstract and seems like something we haven't seen before, but something we actually really know how to do. So let's take a look. OK, so first we're going to talk about interpreting derivatives using graphs. Um, we're going to talk about this is all, almost all things that Mr. Kossoff reviewed, um, but at the end when we're interpreting in a graph, that's gonna be where we start to get some new stuff. And I'm gonna start asking questions. So if you guys could get comfortable in the chat, maybe introduce yourselves to each other, that would be a good idea um, because we're, we're definitely gonna need some participation tonight whenever possible. Okay, so what is a derivative? Do we have any suggestions? What is a derivative? Have you guys learned this in class yet? Are you learning it on your own? What do you think? Awesome, Sierra, it's the slope of a tangent line at a point. Really, we're just working with all slopes here. We're not really doing anything else. Any other interpretations? We have lots of different words for derivative that we can use. Instantaneous rate of change, great. Thank you, Cindy. All right, let's look. What do we have here? Well, first of all, we have the limit definition of a derivative, which is really the instantaneous rate of change definition, saying that the limit as x is approaching c of just our regular old slope, slope formula that we're used to seeing, f of x minus f of c over x minus c is just y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Um, for the next definition, we've changed it a little bit. We've put it in terms of h, and h is really the distance between our two points, and we want the distance between our two points to be approaching zero. We want them to be one point. So we say the limit as h is approaching, our distance is approaching no distance of, the top is still our formula, our y2 minus y1, but on the bottom, our x's have canceled out, and we're just left with h. Okay, 
this is one one way to write it f prime of x if you haven't heard f prime it's that little apostrophe right next to the f um, you should definitely get used to that notation it's really popular um, instantaneous rate of change like cindy said the slope tangent to it like sierra said awesome okay and then we have the value of f prime of c helps us to determine the function if it's increasing or decreasing at c that's something we're going to get into a lot more using the graphs okay all right that's an example there it's a good review we shouldn't we should be okay with that based on tuesday night's lesson if you haven't seen tuesday nights you should definitely go back and watch it you might need to fill in some holes for tonight all right so common notations there are a lot of different ways to write derivatives so there's some really popular ones we already talked about f prime there's another popular way but there's two really famous people that have famous um, notation. So we've got method one, which highlights the D in derivative, the derivative of our output divided by, well not divided by, but over the derivative of our input, um, which becomes, and then that input equals the number. So that's when we wanna find it at an exact point. Um, so a lot of times we'll see dy dx, that's the most common. All right, we're going to skip through this a little faster because this was more of a focus on Tuesday night. I just want to make sure you're used to these notations. So this is the prime, the prime way to write it. What do you guys think? Pros and cons to the methods. Do you guys have a favorite you like? One that's better for you or easier for you? Okay, well, personally, I really like um, the Leibniz method because dy over dx lets me know what my output in is, is and what my input is. So that's a lot easier for me to see. I know what I'm taking the derivative with respect to. When we see prime, we always assume it's with respect to x. Unless x is not a variable, then we have to assume it's with respect to the variable that our function is in terms of. Okay, now to the new stuff the fun stuff with the graphs. So I've got three graphs here, a blue, a green, and a purple, and their functions are there. If you'd like to try graphing them in Desmos or on your calculator right now, that would be a great idea, good way for you to participate. Um, but what we really wanna pay attention to is that these are each derivatives of each other, okay? So green is the derivative of blue, purple is the derivative of green or the second derivative of blue. So what we wanna do is, figure out how are these graphs related? When we see things about these graphs, what are you noticing? Do you guys have any first observations? What do you notice in these graphs? Okay, well, one thing I noticed and that you should notice is that each of them is a power less, just exactly how the derivatives are each a power less, because when we use the power rule. Okay, awesome, Sierra, cubic, quadratic, and linear. Yeah, that's exactly what we have here. It starts as a cubic, we take the derivative, now we've got a quadratic, we take the derivative again, we have a linear. Does it look like anything is um, lining up with them? Like what, what kind of assumptions or what kind of um, comparisons can we make between them? So some, some things that you want to look at are the, the extreme values, so like maximums and minimums, and how those are compared with zeros of other graphs, okay? We're going to get a lot more in-depth than that, but first we want to talk about what it means if your slope is positive, what does that mean for your original function? So for example here, let's look at our green function. No, actually, sorry, our blue function. That's our original function here, okay? Our blue function is increasing until negative one. What should that mean for our derivative? If we have an increasing function, what does our slope have to be?
think about if I take the slope anywhere on that line, positive, great, awesome. So yeah, if your derivative, or sorry, if your original function is increasing, that means your slope must have been positive. So if we put that into words, or one way we can interpret on the graph, if f prime of x is positive, f of x is increasing, okay? So if we look at the green graph from negative infinity to negative one, it should be positive since the graph is increasing and it looks like, yes, it is. Once we get to negative one, our original graph starts decreasing, our f prime of x should be negative, okay? So if f prime of x is negative, f of x is decreasing. These ways of interpreting a graph are ways you're going to be asked of a lot on the AP exam. Um, it's really important that you know how to move from a derivative to a function or from a function to a derivative by looking at a graph, okay? So if you're looking at positive values of slope, positive values of f prime, that means your original function must have been increasing over that entire interval, okay? And then where our original function switches from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing, What's happening is the slope is changing from positive to negative or negative to positive, which means we're going to have a zero at that point. All right, so see at one, our original function has a minimum at negative three because it's going, and it's going from decreasing to increasing, but our derivative is going from negative values until it gets to one and then positive values. How does this apply to the second derivative? Well, it's it's kind of like a chain reaction, okay? Um, and the second derivative helps us understand concavity as well. So if f double prime of x is positive, f prime of x is increasing, okay? Since f double prime is the slope of f prime, f prime of x is increasing, and f of x is concave up, okay? What does it mean to be concave up? What does that look like? Can someone give me an interval on this graph that is concave up? One good thing that I've heard people use is up like a cup, um, down like a frown. So that can kind of help you get an idea of what you should be looking for. So if we're looking for a concave up graph, we could look at, at one. That's, that's our vertex, but that graph to the left and right is concave up. Okay, and there's a point where your graph switches from concave down to concave up or concave up to concave down. That's called an inflection point. Your second derivative helps you find that, but that's not really our focus for tonight. Okay, and then just to conclude, if f double prime of x is negative, f of x is decreasing, and f of x is concave down. Okay, so if the Derivative, if the second derivative is positive, we want to think about this, try and put it in terms of slope. If the second derivative is positive, that means the slope of our slope is increasing. Okay, if the second derivative is positive, our slope is increasing and it's getting more positive. Okay, this is something that takes a lot of practice. Um, but in terms of that interpretation, the main thing you need to know that is that if you see f double prime of x being positive, it is concave up. Okay, so now I want to get a little bit more in depth on the maximum or minimum part. Um, so a lot of times you might be given a function or given a graph and asked of the derivative and asked what maximum or minimums are. Um, so wherever our graph has a maximum or minimum, where should our slope be? Like I said before, our slope or our original function is changing from decreasing to increasing or increasing to decreasing. It means our derivative should be changing from negative to positive or positive to negative. So what, what has to happen for it to change from negative to positive or positive to negative? Zero slope, yes. Okay, so the original function has a zero slope or a horizontal tangent line. That's good. Um, that what that means for our for derivative is this is it is at zero because the derivative is your slope, zero slope. That's great. Okay. So if f of x has a maximum or a minimum, f prime of x will cross the x-axis. Where f of x has an inflection point, a change in concavity, 
if prime of x will have a maximum or minimum, and if double prime of x will cross the x-axis, okay? So I kind of said that one in a backwards order from what I did. Um, no, that's the same order, sorry. Um, so we kind of want to think about it as when we're looking at the second derivative, we're treating the first derivative as our function. Okay, this is another review from Tuesday just to go over units of measurement. Um, I'm just going to show this to you quickly. And it's important to note that when units are involved, this is something that you should be writing down, especially on free response questions, because points can be given just for writing down units. So even if you don't know the math and you put down a unit, you can be earning a point there. So it's important on free response questions that you're writing down all of your work and you're paying attention to what those units are. OK, so normally our units of measurement, um, they can help us figure out which derivative we're working with and if we're working with a derivative at all, because a first derivative is usually a unit per another unit and a second derivative is a unit per another unit squared. OK. All right. And we also want to talk about interpreting the meaning of a derivative. This ties directly back to the graph, and if its slope is negative or positive, it can tell us if the graph is increasing or decreasing and at what rate. So we want to make sure that when we're talking about a certain context that we're paying attention to whether that means the slope should be increasing or decreasing, because the context can really give us a lot of information about the problem. All right, one other thing we're gonna go over today that might be new, or it might be something you have seen already and gone over in class is the mean value theorem. Can I see by a show of yeses, has anyone um, gone over this in class already, mean value theorem? Awesome, okay. All right, so just to have a review then, if there is anyone out there that doesn't know what it is yet or hasn't seen it, the mean value theorem is a theorem with two um, prerequisites. You f of x has to be continuous on the closed interval a to b, and it has to be differentiable on the interval a to b, the open interval. Um, and if those two things are true, then there must be a number c, any number c, that when you plug c into the derivative, if it's between a and b, endpoints of our derivative of, sorry, endpoints of our function, then we should be able to find a point where the instantaneous rate of change, which we called the derivative earlier, is equal to the average rate of change, f of b minus f of a over b minus a, which we talked about earlier with a limit to show that it's instantaneous rate of change. When we don't involve a limit, we're talking about average rate of change. Okay, so f prime of c is equal to f of b minus f of a over b minus a. But again, this only works only works if we have continuity on the interval, differentiable on the interval, and the value is between our two endpoints, A and B. Okay. So just a review, I gave a continuity lesson a while ago. I'm not sure if any of you were there. Um, but if a function is continuous, is it definitely dif differentiable? No, awesome, okay. So we know that a function can be continuous, but it might not be differentiable. How about is, if a function is differentiable? Is it definitely continuous? Yes, great. So if we can say a function is differentiable, we know it's continuous. We don't really have to check for continuity, which is a really nice tool to have when we're using theorems like this that say both things have to be true. If we know it's differentiable, we don't have to check for continuity. All right. Okay. So this is just another way to write it in words. Um, it's really important that this is something you understand at a fundamental level because this is assessed on the exam. But really what we're saying here that the is that the instantaneous rate of change at C, some value between A and B, has the same slope as the average rate of change between A and B as long as it's between them and it's differentiable and continuous. Okay, here's a great picture of, of this, just illustrating how, how this might look on a graph. So we've got our secant line between A and B that has a slope, and then we've got a line, a tangent line at point C that shows these slopes are exactly the same. Um, one of them is a tangent line, and one of them is a secant line. But if I'm going to have 
a continuous differentiable function, there has to be some point there that's going to make these slopes the same. Okay, now we're gonna start practicing problems. So I'm gonna talk through these, and as I go, I will talk through them. If you feel comfortable doing them on your own, you should try it and like mute it for a second, come back when we're looking at the answer. Um, but this is some good practice with ways that you might see the uh, derivative, a graph on the AP exam. Okay, so first you wanna start off and you just wanna take a second to familiar, familiarize yourself with the problem. You wanna read the problem, analyze the graph, and make sure we understand everything it's asking for and what it's asking us to find. Okay, so a truck is traveling straight down a road. For zero to 20 seconds, the car's velocity, V of T, in meters per second, is modeled by the following graph. So our y-axis is our velocity, our x-axis is our seconds, or our time, and it's asking us to find the average rate of change over the interval seven to 16, and then it's saying, does the mean value theorem guarantee a value of C? Okay, we just talked about this value of C, such that V prime of C is equal to the average rate of change. And then why or why not? Okay, so let's take a look at this graph. We've got an increasing slope until three. And then we're constant from three to eight. And then from eight to, tw to 20, we are decreasing until we get back to zero. So we have this velocity that's increasing and then it stays at a constant rate and then it starts decreasing. Sometimes looking at a problem like this, it might seem more complicated than it really is. How much calculus does this problem actually need? Okay, so first thing it's as asking us to do is find the average rate of change. What is the average rate of change? Like what, in other words, do we have words from algebra that helps us find the average rate of change or formulas? We want to think about how this graph is just really a graph that we've worked with many times before. We've had to find slopes of points on graphs a lot of times before. So it's just asking us to find a slope between two points, two points that we have on this graph. What we need is the X and Y values of both of those points. We'll talk about the mean value theorem part later. Okay, so let's talk about finding the average rate of change. So to find it, we're going to use our formula, f of b minus f of a over b minus a, where our a is seven and our b is 16, the beginning and end of our interval, okay? So we need to know f of 16 and f of seven. f of seven is not that hard to find. f of seven we can see because seven is between three and eight is going to be 12 because the graph is constant during that time. f of 16 is a different story. How can we find f of 16? We've got a line there that's going from 8, 12 to 20, 0. How do we find f of 16 if it's on that line? Well, what we want to make sure we're doing here is looking at the slope of this line and really the equation of this line. So what we're going to do is we're going to find the equation of the line that goes from 8, 12 to 20, 0. And that equation, we can plug 16 into and we'll find the y value of 16. We will find f of 16. Okay, so f of 16, we get, well, we get that f of x, if we call this line f of x, is negative x plus 20. That's what I got. You guys, again, should try it on your own. Make sure you get the same thing. Um, and then if we plug 16 into that function, in order to find f of 16, we get that it equals 4. Okay, that's good. So we just found f of 16. So now we have all the information we need to find the average rate of change. Remember, always go back and ask yourself, what am I looking for? Am I on my way there? How much more do I need to do? Um, because you could very easily find f of 16 and then think, oh, I did, I did it. No, I'm not done. I've got to keep going. I've got to find the average rate of change. Okay, so we should get negative eight ninths. You guys can check that on your own. Again, mute the video if you want to try it on your own. Um, but that is our average rate of change. All right. But we just found the average rate of change of the velocity. Okay. So the average rate of change of the velocity is negative eight ninths meters per second per second or meters per second squared. Does anyone know what we call the rate of change of velocity? 
this might be something you haven't gotten to yet, or maybe if you're in physics, you've already talked about it. Yes, Kim, welcome. Acceleration is right. You, If you haven't talked about it yet, that is definitely going to be a section you go over um, in particle mo motion and rectilinear motion. Okay, now we need to talk about the mean value theorem. Do we remember the mean value theorem? Probably, because I just went over it five, 10 minutes ago. Um, but here it is again, just in case you forgot. So the derivative at a point C, the instantaneous rate of change, is the same as the average rate of change for some point in between A and B, as long as the function is continuous and differentiable. Okay, so I wanna take a second and think does the mean value theorem apply to this problem? Is there a way that we can guarantee that there is a value of C between A and B that will tell us that the instantaneous rate of change is equal to the average rate of change? Think about what it means to be differentiable, what it means to be continuous, right? Because we have to make sure that our, um, our prerequisites are satisfied. We have to make sure everything is satisfied before we can say this is true. So is this graph continuous and differentiable? All right, I see a yes. Do we agree with that? What do we think? What makes something continuous and what makes it differentiable? Well, while I'm looking at the graph, I'm looking at him saying, well, it's definitely continuous. There are no points on it where it's not continuous. But I'm wondering about the differentiability. What do we know makes something differentiable or not differentiable? It's important to think about this. There's a couple different ways to think about this. Um, first is thinking about the limit definition of a derivative. The limit as h approaches zero from the left of f of x plus h minus f of x over h has to equal the limit as h approaches zero from the right of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. Um, what that's generally saying is that the slope from the left and the slope from the right have to be the same in order for you to be differentiable at that point. In this case, it's looking like when we go from constant to decreasing, we don't have that. We don't have a, we have a slope of zero and then automatically a slope of negative one. There's no transition there where we're kind of, we have a like a nice smooth curve to train to change from one derivative to the next. But in this case, we just kind of meet at 812, that point, and they go their separate ways. One has a slope at zero and one has a slope at negative one. Right, so yeah, so we're actually gonna say this one's not differentiable. Um, one way you can know it's differentiable just by looking at it is anytime a graph has a corner, a point where it just meets sharply, it's not gonna be differentiable at that point. So since we're trying to see if it's differentiable between seven and 16, it's not gonna be differentiable. And in that case, since you have to be differentiable for the mean value theorem to apply, it is not going to be able to use the mean value theorem here. Okay, so it's important we know what differentiable means and that we know what it looks like on a graph. Okay. Now that we've gone over it in context and we've seen it on a graph that we've kind of had to interpret a little more, we're going to go now into more abstract and talk about the derivative rules that might be needed like chain product and quotient rule. Okay, so what are the, the rules that we might have to know? Like what is the chain rule? That might be hard to type out. Maybe I should just tell you um, based on our attendance right now. So, a common exam question is going to be to have a function that's defined by other functions, and you might have to derive those other functions within that function, okay? Um, so we're going to have to use chain rule, product rule, and quotient rule. This is a great way of writing out these derivatives. These are rules you should just know. You should know the product rule. You should know the chain rule and the quotient rule. Um, and the more problems the pra you practice, the more you'll be able to recognize which one you have to use. In general, if you're multiplying, you're using product rule because you're finding a product. If you're dividing, you're using quotient rule because you're finding a quotient. If you have a function within a function, you're using chain rule because you have to take every function that's inside each other and find its derivative and multiply them together. 
you're taking a chain of derivatives from one function on the outside all the way to the smallest function on the inside. Okay. So here's a new problem. The figure shows the graph of f prime, the derivative of the function f, which we are examining on the closed interval negative two to two. The graph of f prime has a horizontal tangent line at x equals negative two and at x equals one. The function is twice, di twice differentiable at f of negative one equals three and f of negative one equals c, three, sorry. So we want to, that's a, that's a lot of information. Do we even know what we're looking for yet? No, we, all we've read is a lot of information about this graph and some information about the function. We know this graph is of a derivative of a function, okay? So g, a different function, is defined by g, g of x equals x times f of x. And we want to find an equation for the line tangent to the graph of g at x equals 1. Okay, so automatically when you hear find an equation for the line tangent to the graph, what are you thinking? You hear equation of a line tangent to a graph. These questions can come up almost in almost any part of the AP exam. AP, um, AP creators, they love the questions about how to find the equation of a tangent line, okay? So it's important that we're thinking point slope form. We need a point and we need our slope and we need to be able to interpret and find those points and slopes uh, based on what we're given. So in our case, we're using g, and we want g at x equals negative 1. So I'm going to write out point-slope form using those values. So y minus g of negative 1, so the y value when we plug in negative 1, is going to equal, our slope is going to be whatever g prime is at negative 1, and then times x minus negative 1, which is our x value we're working with. Does that look familiar and look good to everybody? I just want to make sure everyone's seen point slope form and that that form makes sense. Okay, awesome. Well, I haven't gotten any response. Make sure that if you do not know what it is, you can ask the question. We can talk about it. Um, but we're going to go forward in finding this information that we're missing here. Okay, so we need to find g of negative 1, and we need to find g prime of negative 1. So g of negative 1 is probably going to be a little bit easier because we don't have to find a derivative. So let's talk about g of negative 1 first. Well, we know g is x times f of x. So g of negative 1 is going to be negative 1 times f of negative 1. So negative 1 is just negative 1 times f of negative 1 is 3. So now we've used some information that it told us. We haven't even used the graph yet, but it did tell us that f of negative 1 is 3. So we needed to use that 3. We multiply those, we get negative 3. Okay, so we've found one piece of information, but now we still need to find the derivative. So what rule do you think we're going to be using to find the derivative of g of x? If g of x is x times f of x, what rule are we going to need to use? Okay, we've gotten chain and product as answers. I'm going to go with product for this because we're multiplying x times f of x. So since we're multiplying those two functions, we're going to need to find product rule, use product rule for them. Okay, so g prime of x is going to be x times f prime of x plus f of x times 1. Okay, so we used um, our first function as x and our second function as f of x. So we have our first function times our derivative of our second function plus our second function times the derivative of our first function. That is product rule. And now if we want to find g prime of negative 1, we just have to plug in negative 1 everywhere. Okay, so we have negative 1 times f prime of negative 1 plus f of negative 1 times 1 because 1 was our derivative of x. Okay, now here's where the graph comes into play. We haven't even used the graph at all yet, and we're almost done with the problem here. Um, f prime of negative 1. You need to use the graph for this because the graph is of f prime. Do you know what f prime of negative 1 is? 7. Awesome. That's, that's exactly right. All you have to do is look at the graph. Know that the graph is talking about the derivative and not the original function, and see that f prime of negative 1 is 7. 
Um, the biggest mistake people make here is that they think f of negative one is seven and they forget that this is a graph of the derivative. So it's really important that you know exactly what your graph is telling you. Is it telling you about your function? Is it telling you about your derivative? All right, so then once we do that, once we plug in seven, we get that g prime of negative one should be negative four. Okay, and that's our equation. Y minus negative three, our g of negative one, equals negative four times x plus one because it was minus negative one. And you can actually leave it like this on AP. This is a completely correct answer. Um, but if you like to simplify, you should get negative four x minus seven. AP says you can write this either way and it is full credit. Okay, so now you wanna think about what would we have done differently if g of x had been x over f of x instead of x times f of x? What did we change and what does that change about our problem? Same thing with the second question. What if g of x was f of x squared? Good. So for question one, we'd use quotient rule instead of product rule because we're dividing. How about for question two, if g of x was f of x cubed? chain rule. That's exactly right. So it's really important that you're really closely analyzing these functions to see which rule you need to use. All right. So let's look at what I've got written for this. So we do still need to find g of negative one and g prime of negative one. But in this case, we're going to need to find those values again, because now that we have new functions, we're going to be applying new rules to find the derivative. We're going to be plugging in the numbers in a different way. Okay. So this formula still applies. That's why it's great to just write the formula out first so that you have kind of like something you can go back to to say, I know this is how I find an equation of a tangent line. How I find the slope and the point might be different every time, but I know I'm going back to this equation because I'm still using G, I'm still using the graph of F prime, and I'm still using F. Okay, so if you evaluate this for the quotient rule problem, when you plug in G of negative one, you get negative one third because f of negative one is still three. Um, and then quotient rule, again, have to plug into quotient rule. It's really important you just remember quotient rule and can actively use it and plug into it. Um, I'm sure your teachers may have given you some uh, shortcuts to try and remember it. I know my students like the low D high minus high D low over low low. I don't know if you guys have heard it. Um, feel free to chime in if you have other ways of remembering it, but that's one that I like as long as you don't forget the rhyme and you say the rhyme right, then you will get it right. <laughs> um, so G prime of negative one using quotient rule, we can find it and we get that it is 10 over nine. Okay. And we plug that into our formula. Y plus one third equals 10 over nine X plus one. Any questions there? How are we feeling with that? All right, good. Again, feel free to ask me questions if you have any. Okay, so how about for the chain rule here? Chain rule is definitely a little bit more challenging because you have to recognize which pieces of these are the chain, what is the inner part of the chain and the outer part of the chain, um, and how do I find it? So in this case, we have two pieces of a chain. We have the f of x function on the outside and we have the x cubed function on the inside. So when we take the derivative of the f function, we don't wanna to touch the inside. We wanna treat it as if it's a, if not a constant, but just its own variable. It doesn't matter that it's cubed, it's just its own variable. It's not being touched because we're only finding the derivative of the outside. Then we go in a step and we say, okay, now we wanna find the derivative of x cubed and multiply that in to make sure that we have considered each function that's within, okay? So when we take the through chain rule, g prime of x should be f prime of x cubed, that x cubed should still be there, times the derivative of x cubed, which is three x squared. So now we've got to find g of negative, g prime of negative one, we're not done yet. Um, when we plug in negative one, again, using the same values from our graph, knowing that g prime of negative one is seven, knowing that g of negative one is three, we are able to find our slope and our y value to get y minus three plus 21 x plus one. <clears throat> 
Okay, any questions? All right, you guys are doing great so far. Thank you to those who are participating. I really appreciate it. It helps me know where you're at. Um, time to move on to another problem. Okay, so we've got a graph here again. Let's make sure that we, so we, we've got this graph. It says it's a graph of F. So we know it's not the derivative. It's just the function. Let's make sure we look and read everything in the problem that we need. Make sure we're interpreting everything we need correctly. So the graph of the function F consists of two line segments as shown in the figure. Let G be the function given by G of X equals 2X plus 5. And H be the function given by, that should say, sorry, H of X equals F of G of X. Okay, so we've got F, which is the graph. We've got G, which is 2X plus 5. And then H is the F of G of X. So that's my fault on that typo there. It should be H of X, not H prime of X equals F of G of X. So, and then it says, what is the value of H prime of negative one? Okay. So again, we wanna make sure we're staying organized. What are we looking for? And what do we need to get there? So what am I looking for? Well, I'm looking for the derivative of H at negative one. What do I need to get there? Well, I need to find the derivative of H and then I might need to find more information after that. So again, just like with the last problem, because we have a function within a function, we're gonna be using chain rule to find this derivative. Okay, so if if h of x is f of g of x, then h prime of x is going to be f of g of f prime of g of x times g prime of x. So h prime of negative one is going to be f of f prime of g of negative one times g prime of negative one. Now, in this case, we have really different ways we're going to have to find these things. How do we find g of negative one? We need to go back to our problem, look at our context. How do we find G of negative one? Plug negative one into the G of X equation. That's exactly right, Kim. So we're gonna take negative one, we're gonna plug it into two X plus five, um, and we're, we should get, 2x plus 5, we're going to get 3, okay? Um, I didn't write that out here, but I have it up on the right here, f of 3, f prime of 3. Um, so how do we find g prime of negative 1? Well, we have to find g prime first. So we look at our equation 2x plus 5 for g of x. Um, and if we find the derivative for that, that's simple power rule. Derivative of 2x is just 2. Derivative of 5 is 0. So if g prime of x equals two, g prime of negative one is gonna be two because at any point, whatever you plug into the derivative, you're going to get two. The derivative is a constant. Okay, and then finding f prime of g of negative one, well, g of negative one, when we plug it in, we get three. So we're really looking for f prime of three. How do we find f prime of three? We've got a graph of f. How do we find f prime of three? Well, we know that three is between five and one, right? And we've got a line here that goes from one to five. So what we should be doing, since we know derivative means slope, is we wanna find the slope of this line. That'll be the slope at three. Okay, so when we find the slope, we end up with negative three minus five over five minus one. That's Again, our regular old slope formula from algebra two, that is something so important. We don't want to forget it. We get negative one half. That is F prime of G of negative one. So now we have G prime of negative one and F prime of G of negative one. We use those together to find H prime of negative one, which is going to be those two things multiplied together, negative one half times two, which is one, negative one, sorry. Two equal signs, it should be a negative. Something else I'll fix after. All right, so we've got negative one 
And that's our slope. We had to use our graph again for one thing. It's just really important we know what that one thing is. Okay, here's our next question. The graphs of two differentiable functions, f and g, are shown. k of x is f of x times g of x. Which of the following statements must be true about k of x or k prime of 1? Okay, so which of the following statements must be true? So maybe there are some of these that could be true, but we're not sure. We don't know. Um, but we need to know which one must be true, okay? So if k of x equals f of x times g of x, what rule do we need to make sure that we know um, what k prime of x is? How are we going to find k prime of x? We've got f of x times g of x. We've got two functions being multiplied together, so it looks like product rule to me going to keep showing up. We can't forget those. It's going to be on, once you learn it, you have to know it throughout the rest of the year until you get to the end. Chain rule, product rule, quotient rule. So here we've got product rule. It's two functions, f of x and g of x, but we still have to use product rule in order to find their derivative. Okay, so let's take a look at this a little bit closer. k prime of x is going to be f of x times g prime of x plus g of x times f prime of x. That's what our product rule says. Okay, we don't know anything exact about these graphs. We have pictures of them, but we don't have any exact points, or nor do we know them or know how to find them because we don't have any equations for them. What we can do is look at these graphs at one, these graphs of f and graphs of g. We know f prime of one, sorry, not f. We know f of one is greater than zero because the graph is above zero. The graph is above y equals zero. All right, we know that g of 1 is also greater than 1 because the graph, again, is above the x-axis, okay? The slopes at x equals 1 for f, of f and g are both increasing. So if we look at 1 and we look at its slope, it's getting higher. That means the, the slope is positive. Same thing at 1 on the graph of g. The slope, slope is positive. So we need to know how to interpret these graphs and say, what is this graph telling us about the slope? Well, if the graph is increasing, the slope is positive. Okay, so like even, even for, if you look at the graph of G, if you look at negative 2, I could tell you that at negative 2, the derivative, the slope, is positive. So I know that that graph is going, of the derivative is going to be in the positive section. Anyway, back to the regular problem. Since we know that both of the slopes are increasing, f prime of 1 is going to be greater than 0 because it's a positive slope, and g prime of 1 is going to be greater than 0 since it's a positive slope. So what we do know is that every piece of this function is greater than 0. When you multiply everything that's positive and then you add everything together that's positive, we know that it's going to have to be positive. So our choice is b, that k prime of 1 must be greater than 0 because, or k, yeah, must be true because there are no negative values that would make us have something negative. So just looking at these graphs, we could interpret a lot about their derivatives, a lot about their own graphs on their own, and we don't even know any numbers. All right, last question of the night here. So if f of x equals 2x cubed minus 3x squared minus 12x, where on what intervals is f of x increasing and decreasing? And what are the maximum or minimum values? So we're taking a little bit of a different turn, going back to what we know at the beginning, what we talked about for if we have a maximum or minimum of the original, we have a zero on our derivative. Okay, so f prime of x is going to be 6x squared minus 5x minus 12, using power rule. Um, and then if we want to know when the derivative is going to be zero, that's going to tell us when it's a max or min. So if we set this equal to zero, our derivative, and we factor it, we get that x is, or y is zero when x is three or negative two, okay? So now we have to test each of those intervals. So we have an interval from negative infinity to negative two, because that's where our critical value is, that's where we stop. We have an interval from negative two to three, and we also have an interval from three to infinity. All right, so if we look at those intervals and 
the best thing to do here is to pick a test point, pick a point within each of those intervals to try and see if we can figure anything out about it. So if we look at the interval from negative infinity to negative two, if we plug in a value in between them, let's say negative five, if we were to plug that into our derivative, we would get a positive value. Since the derivative is positive, we know the original is increasing. From negative two to three, we know that f prime of x is negative. If we plug in, the easiest value to plug in there is probably zero. We're gonna get negative 12 as an answer. So it's negative, which means between negative two and three, the graph of f of x is gonna be decreasing. From three to infinity, f prime of x is gonna be positive. So f of x is increasing. Again, we got that by plugging in test numbers in between each and figuring out is that point the value, the y value I get out of there, positive or negative? If so, what does that mean about my original graph? Okay, so because we know when the original graph is increasing or decreasing, we can tell if we have a maximum or a minimum. So for example, if we're going from increasing to decreasing, you can even draw this with your arm, increasing to decreasing, we have to have a maximum because we were going up, we got up until we went to a certain point and then we started going down. We maximized and then we went back down. So at negative two, our first critical value there, our original function is gonna have a maximum value. And then at three, we're going from decreasing from negative two to three to increasing from three to infinity. Decreasing to increasing, we're gonna have a minimum right in there. So we know that there's a minimum at three. This is really helpful because now we can even draw a big portion of the graph. We don't know exact points, but we can draw a lot of it. Um, a, a question like this would probably appear in a no calculator section because obviously you can just plug the function into your calculator and see when it's increasing and decreasing and what its max and mins are. So it's important that not only can we plug these into our calculator, but we can interpret them in our heads. Okay, but plugging into your calculator, if you have one right now, or to Desmos, that would be a really good check. Awesome. All right. Any questions about that kind of problem? That might be one of the most conceptually, um, one that's a little bit more difficult because you have to know the relationship between derivatives and functions when not even looking at a graph. Okay. So you want to be able to think in your head, if I find a point where my derivative is zero, that means my function has a horizontal asymptote or well, like a horizontal tangent line. And so I must have a max or a min at that point because I'm changing my slope. I'm changing from positive to negative or from negative to positive because my slope leveled out at zero at some point. Okay. Awesome. All right. So let's review what we talked about tonight. So we interpreted derivatives and we used graphs. We talked about the meaning of a derivative, what it means in a sentence, and we talked about what it means looking at a function in a derivative and its second derivative on a graph. We talked about estimating derivatives from a graph using average rate of change. And we talked about using chain rule, product rule, and quotient rule when we were defining new functions and using graphs. We also talked about finding maximums and minimums. That was a good thing that we still had time to do before our time was out for today. Um, I hope that you all got something out of this lesson. I welcome any feedback at any point. Um, thank you to those who participated. Uh, it really helps move the lesson along and helps me know where you're at. If you have any questions, again, feel free to ask me a question in the ask a question part. This video will be uploaded on Fiveable, something you should follow. So please make sure to reach out to me. If you have any questions, reach out to Fiveable. Um, I hope that you had a good time and that you got something out of it. Have a good night. Thank you.